We are very happy to have uh, Mr. Joshi from Research join us, distinguished engineer at Research, and uh, he uh, uh, he dual role is at technology uh, innovator and really cutting edge of what is happening collaborative assist. The second role he has a guide uh, I this area as happening in the portfolio. Longer bio on the uh, screen, I just wanted to give you of uh, uh, Sachin as a, who's looking at the technical and side of uh, technology. We are very thrilled to have uh, such uh, us. Sachin, uh, to share this. Uh, so I hope that the network connection is fine. Uh, please let me know if there is a problem. Uh, what I plan to do is to kind of talk at a very high level, the approaches that have been taken on building dialogue systems uh, in industrial settings and in research. And there is a kind of gap between the two efforts. Of course, uh, many people are aware of uh, the development on uh, either side of uh, uh, the school, but so I, I'm just going to talk about what different ways these things are being built and where the gaps are. So uh, just to give uh, a way, view in terms of how the systems were built uh, before the deep learning uh, started to take a more central role in research, uh, I wanted to talk about very briefly about the Jabardi system, which was a question answering system that IBM uh, uh, did. And uh, that Jeopardy system, which where you had the you know a set of categories from which, from which question could be asked, and there were different levels of difficulty, and then there were players who will play, uh, and then the question would look like like the following: All policemen can thank Stephanie Pollack for her invention of this polymer fiber, five times tougher than steel, and you know you are supposed to say, okay, what is color? So uh, this was the way the Jeopardy system was played, and IBM Watson Jeopardy system did phenomenally good job and was able to defeat all the champions, uh, which was a good illustration of what was technically possible at that time. And this was in 2011. Now, one, uh, I will not go into the details of how this system was built, but to uh, give a contrast with the way things are built now, I think it's important to see how a question which comes to the system, what kind of processing it goes through, or it used to go through with, with a system like Watson Jeopardy. So you have a question like in 1698, this comet discoverer took a ship called Paramar Pink on the first purely scientific sea voyage. And when you had something called a question analysis, which will kind of uh, extract all the important keywords from this question, uh, it will find out all the documents that contain those kind of keywords. It will find out what are the possible candidate answers uh, from these documents. And then for each of these documents, it will find out some kind of evidence whether this particular candidate answer. So for example, Isaac Newton is the answer for this given question, which is in the blue tags. And for that, it, there were a big set of features that were, that were kind of discovered and engineered and worked upon which would try to find out what kind of lexical similarities are there, what kind of spatial similarity are there, what kind of temporal similarity are there, so and so forth. And then you will get an answer back, uh, you know, which is like Edmund Halley in this particular case. So the important point to note is that the system used to be built, which had a lot of feature engineering, where you will get a sense of what the possible candidate answers are, and then for each of those candidate answer, you will try to see what kind of features are giving what kind of evidence. And you know these features being lexical, temporal, spatial, and many other, there were hundreds of different features which were used to rank these different candidate answers. Now, now things have changed quite a lot. So we'll, we'll, we'll see that also. Okay, so with that brief overview of you know, question answering, which is kind of a very simple conversation, uh, uh, let's look at what kind of conversations we we have, and uh, and there are there is one kind of conversation which look like this, which is like you know what are your hobbies? I like to read and sometimes watch movies. What kind of movies? So and so forth, right? So this is what is known as a chit chat kind of a conversation. There is no specific goal. It's just kind of conversing, engaging with a with another user, just talking without any defined 
uh, goal or task at hand. Uh, contrast that to something like, I would like to book a hotel in Rome, right? And sure, I can help you with that, which dates you want to book for, so and so forth. So now you see that these kind of conversations are what are known as task-oriented uh, conversations. There is a very specific goal, which is about booking a hotel. And then uh, these kind of conversation, which are trying to achieve a specific task or a goal are referred as task-oriented and goal-oriented uh, conversations. So you have these two different types of conversation. And uh, there are different approaches that have been tried to build uh, bots, uh, which can support chit chat or task oriented kind of conversations. Uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, so basically, we'll see how both these kind of uh, conversations are modeled, what are the different ways, and then uh, 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 both in the industry as well as in research. And then we'll see what kind of gaps are there and how we can you know, bridge those gaps. Uh, that's how I plan to spend next maybe 20, 25 minutes. Uh, again, I have already talked about these types of bots, task-oriented bot and chit chat bot. The task-oriented bot are very uh, kind of, you know, have been already, you could see glimpses of it being used as part of personal assistant where we want to book meetings and so on and so forth. There are a set of different techniques that have been studied and proposed and worked upon, uh, which are POMDP or decision process-based approaches and more recently uh, reinforcement learning based approaches uh, the chit chat bot uh, where uh, are, are 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 kind of seen more as a sequence to sequence model and there are many other developments that have happened in last uh, two to three years i would say uh, which are you know very good at building these chit chat kind of bots also so if you see what kind of ways and methods have been used in building dialogue system, there are you could classify them largely at two different ways. One is what are called pipeline approach, uh, and pipeline approach is kind of similar to what Watson Jeopardy system was, which had a pipeline where you do something and then you, the output of that module is kind of used in the next module and that produces something, so and so forth, right? So conversation is a complicated process, and then you have a pipeline which performs uh, separate things and then feed into each other. And that's a pipeline approach. The end-to-end -end modeling approach is more recent thing, which has started only four to five years back, which kind of just take the dialogue context and directly outputs the response. So that's what is called end-to-end -end modeling approach. These two approaches have been largely being used uh, 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 for building dialogue systems in research. Uh, uh, and then, so to give more details on how task-oriented dialogue system uh, work, so for, uh, for a question like find a good eating place for Taiwanese food, uh, you get a response back like this. So what happens? How do you get this kind of an answer? Uh, how the system process through this kind of a question is, is of, uh, if the speech is there, of course, you need to do a speech recognition first. And there could be some noise there, right? So you may uh, not uh, subscribe to the transcription itself, but you could look at all the different hypotheses also, uh, uh, right? So those kind of things also exist. And then you take whatever is the transcription, you first do what is called language understanding. Uh, and so language understanding is only taking what users said and trying to map them to some kind of symbols which are known. Uh, you know how to deal with those symbols. Uh, and we'll see what, the, what those things are. And then once you, have, you know what those symbols are, you kind of get a dialogue state. Uh, 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 and then from the dialogue state, you know that you have something called a dialogue policy where, which basically is nothing more than saying, if you are in this kind of a state, this is what you do. So you have a dialogue policy, and then you, based on that, you generate a response back, right? So that's how uh, a task-oriented dialogue system is designed. Uh, all these different modules could be implemented in several different ways. Uh, and, you know, things have evolved uh, uh, with as, as uh, deep learning has evolved also where different kind of things have been used. Uh, across these different components. Uh, to give it more concrete understanding, uh, uh, if, for example, given a question like find a good eating place for Taiwanese food, uh, you first thing that you want to do is you want to find out what the domain is, right? So if you have a bot which can handle uh, restaurant bookings and taxi bookings and, and so on and so forth, you need to find out, okay, which general domain you're talking about, that's a typical classification problem. Uh, so given that kind of a question, you want to find out it is a restaurant DB, right? And then uh, uh, you also need to find out, so this restaurant DB is one symbol which you can extract from this 
uh, user utterance. And then you want to find out, okay, uh, you are looking for an eating place, right? So find restaurant is kind of intent that you want, uh, which is also some kind of a classification task. And then you want to find out that, okay, you want some good, which is a rating, and you want to find Taiwanese food, right? Which is a kind of a cuisine type. So these are different uh, slots. So this is what is, again, a very standard uh, problem, which you could see in many places in natural language processing, which is the slot filling or uh, uh, sequence labeling task. So you need to find out uh, from the utterance, find a good eating place for Taiwanese food. Good is a rating, Taiwanese is a cuisine type, right? So those kind of things you want to find out. Now, given that kind of a processing, and this is the whole thing is happening under language understanding, uh, given the uh, user utterance, like find a good eating place for Taiwanese food, you have found out that you are looking for a restaurant whose rating is good and the restaurant type or the cuisine type is Taiwanese. So you have come out, come up with this kind of a very structured information from uh, the natural language text that you got, right? So this is what language understanding does. So now your understanding is, uh, is, is very concrete what it is. And then uh, from the user utterance, once you have that understanding built, uh, and then there could be some kind of a uh, uncertainties here because uh, because of the speech uh, problem, uh, the, there could be background noise, so on and so forth. So you may not be sure whether it's Taiwanese or Thai or what, right? So you could that could be a case, right? So now what you see here as a graph here is that you know what you wanted to know was okay if you are doing find restaurant, you want to find location, you want to find rating, and you want to find type, uh, and then. Uh, like you uh, from like if uh, you don't know anything about the user request, but if you know about rating, then from rating you can go to rating and type, and then all. So you need to find all all three information: location, rating, and type. And that's what the dialogue, uh, uh, all the different dialogue states are mapped here. So in this particular case, we know uh, what is the what is the rating and what is the type. So we are in this node, uh, and we want to find all. So so you know what is next thing that that, that needs to be done. Right, so that's what the dialogue policy is. So once you know the state of the conversation, you then can either inform that what is the nearest uh, restaurant is, or you could find for location, for example, right? Because you don't know the location. So you can ask, okay, you're looking the restaurant for what location? Or if you had a situation where you're not sure whether you are talking about Taiwanese cuisine or Thai cuisine, then you can confirm, did you want Taiwanese food? Just to make sure that you are at the right dialogue state. So these are different dialogue policy, which tells exactly what kind of actions can be taken. Uh, and there are different ways in which uh, such policy determinations can be done. Um, and then uh, once you do that, you generate uh, uh, the natural language, right? Like if you selected, okay, I need to confirm, then you will just respond back to say, did you want Taiwanese food? And again, either you could give a natural language generation or you could also, uh, you could do these things in a different way. You may not do it in a textual way, but you could have a UI way of doing it where you could just make it confirm on a mobile phone screen. Or if you are look, giving a restaurant result, you may either say, okay, the nearest restaurant is here, or you could just directly show it in the map, right? So that's just a way you are going to render back the information. So. That's how, uh, 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 if you see, a task-oriented dialogue system can be designed. Like we talked about language understanding, which takes uh, the natural language and put the symbols around it, like find restaurant and cuisine type is Thai, uh, uh, Thai or Taiwanese. Uh, and then you do a dialogue management and state, uh, dialogue state tracking and policy to find out what is the next thing that you need to say. And once you know that, then you just generate the natural language, right? So this is how the pipeline-based approach work. Uh, and then the second approach, which is very popular nowadays, is this end-to-end -end modeling approach, where you basically uh, take a uh, conversation and you basically, given the dialogue context, you will just give the output back, right? So uh, for that, there is this whole modeling technique called sequence to sequence, where you take a sequence input and give back a sequence output, which is very popular in, um, in, in deep learning where you have machine translation system built like this, uh, where you give one sentence and you get its translated version out. Uh, uh, you could also do uh, sequence output, right? Like the problem that we saw where we wanted to find out slots, right? Uh, from the user utterance, you could use the same sequence input, sequence output kind of machinery to do that also, where you write Albert lives in Baltimore as the sequenced input, the output being person, 
no named entity, no named entity and location, right? So that's, so you can model a lot of tasks as sequence input and sequence output. Uh, of course, the conversation kind of falls in that category very easily uh, where, where you will have a dialogue context so far and you want to generate the response back. So the sequence input and sequence output, there is there are a lot of ways in which you could do this now. Uh, so how do you handle these sequences, right? Because the sequence could be of variable length. So we need, so there are some ways in which you kind of get a fixed size encoder, which takes whatever the input is and get a representation of that input in a fixed size uh, vector, which is what is called embedding, right? So, uh, and, and that's what is done in all these approaches. And we will see uh, slightly how that is done in one particular way. Uh, and then given that fixed size input, which is what is called an embedding, you have a thing called encoder, uh, decoder, which takes this embedding and generate one word at a time output till the time your, your output uh, is kind of, uh, you get a stop sign that you know you don't want to uh, output any more words. So that's what is, uh, what is uh, uh, done in sequence modeling tasks, uh, right? So, so in case of translation, it will be, you got a, a sentence, das Hoss is Ross, uh, uh, you kind of encode it. So there is something called an encoder, which takes this input and get a particular embedding or a vector, which is fixed size. And then you have a decoder, which takes this vector and then output one word at a time. The house is big and then stop sign. So you stop, right? So that's how these sequence models work. Uh, and then there are, uh, the sequence models also, there are various different ways in which this has been done. Of course, RNN is one of the very popular approach uh, till 2018, I would say. Uh, and then uh, uh, and then you, so how RNN worked is that you are given a word, you get its embedding, which is its representation of the word, you get a hidden state and you predict the next word, right? So this is a language modeling task that is being done here. Uh, and you output the, then the the is fed back and then you kind of output house, then you feed house and you output is so and so forth, right? Till the time you get the stop sign. Now it is, uh, there are uh, uh, these transformer models which are being used for again, sequence to sequence uh, task. Uh, RNN is one option, but now you could use transformers which use self attention, which are very, very powerful and very effective. So everybody now uses pretty much uh, these transformer models, uh, uh, which again does the same thing, which given a, a variable length input is able to generate a variable length output, right? And you can train them for that. Uh, so that's what is done in transformer. Uh, so using these end-to-end -end modeling approaches, which is like RNN or transformer models, you can now take your conversations and use these machineries to generate outputs, right? Or give response back. So if the input context is, hello, how may I help you? Uh, I am unable to start notes email client. Okay, which operating system do you use? So this is the conversation so far. So that's become your input context. And you have this encoder, which takes this input context and get a fixed size embedding for it, which is called context embedding. And then decoder takes this context embedding and output one word at a time till the time you see the stop sign and you output things like I am using Ubuntu, right? So that becomes your next output. So as you see here, unlike in the pipeline approach where there are no uh, language understanding piece separate, uh, the slot filling kind of things happening, the dialogue state tracking kind of things happening, a policy and all those things, none of those things are there. It's just end to end. It means just give the input and you have encoder decoder architecture, which is going to give you output back. So that's how uh, a vast majority of models have been proposed on modeling conversations in the last three or four years, uh, which use these end to end modeling approaches. Okay. Uh, so that's how pretty much all the different conversation systems that are built in research in academia are being built. They are built like this. Contrast that to the way things happen in industry. In industry, we have what are called these frameworks and uh, IBM Watson Assistant is one such framework. You have a similar kind of frameworks from Google called Dialogflow, from Amazon called Lex, so and so forth. And these industrial frameworks are are, are, are very different nature. Like they have, uh, largely speaking, a notion of what, are, what is called intent and then another uh, concept called dialogue flow. And they're very fairly easy to understand. So 
the intent is basically what the intent notion of these framework does is that it takes the user input and it again kind of creates a symbol out of it, right? So which is an intent. What is the user's intent, right? So here are some example of user intent like laptop heat is a intent and this could be expressed by users in many different ways. So suppose I'm trying to build a chatbot for troubleshooting uh, uh, and heating of laptop is one problem that comes very often. So I will create an intent called laptop heat and I will give a few examples like my laptop overheats a lot and shut down. My system gets overheated. My machine gets hot too quickly. These are different ways in which people talk about heating of their laptop. Similarly, uh, maybe email not opening is another problem. So I go ahead and define an intent for email not opening and uh, you know give examples on how people are going to talk about email not opening, so and so forth, right? So using these frameworks, I have a mechanism by which I can define these intent and I give examples in terms of how these intents are expressed by end users. And once I have done that, now next I, what I do is to uh, 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 descri describe a flow of the dialogue, which would be you know, like, hello, how may I help you is the first thing that comes out of the bot. And now if users say something which gets mapped to laptop heat intent, then you say, then the bot is going to say, could you let me know the serial number of your machine? Now, based on that, if user says something which can be identified as serial number, then the bot is going to say, your complaint has been noted down, your complaint ID is something, thanks for using our service. So what you see here, that the dialogue flow basically tries to use the intents that you have described and then create a flow, which is rule-based, that when users say something like this, then do that, user said something like this, then say that, so and so, so forth, right? So that's how industrial dialogue frameworks work. Uh, there are some differences uh, here and there, uh, but largely speaking, <coughs> most systems are working with a framework like this. Now, what you see here, like if you are trying to build these bots in academic research, there is a lot of deep learning based methods being used, a lot of research where you have sequence to sequence and coder decoder. And then there are a lot of work around using hierarchical versions of them, variational uh, inferencing kind of being used there, deep reinforcement learning being used there, memory networks being used there. There are immense amount of research which has happened on building these uh, conversational system using deep learning kind of framework with task oriented as well as with chit chat. So that's what has been happening in the academic side of the world. On the industry side, you have a natural language understanding which is uh, machine learning based like we saw intent and you give these intent examples which are used for uh, learning a classifier so it's a machine learning based understanding piece and the dialogue management is pretty much rule based if you if if, if, if users say this then say that or users say this then do that and then say that so and so forth and all these different frameworks uh, actually performs this thing now uh, the the good part about these deep learning based approaches is that they're completely data driven they are using how you how the past conversations behave right how people are doing the conversations earlier and learn from it so they are data driven uh, but they are very difficult to interpret in terms of if if the bot came back with some response it's very difficult to see exactly why it said that right and more importantly there is no control if you if as a company you don't want uh, uh, the system to come back with a response like this, but only like that, a specific way, then it's very hard to control. <clears throat> so these are difficult to interpret, debug, and control. Control is a very important thing. And contrast that to industry kind of things where uh, you have these uh, uh, Microsoft bot and Watson Assistant, they are very easy to interpret. You know why it responded back like the way it did, but, and you have much better control. But you need to hand code it, you need to build it, right? So that's where the gaps are. The deep learning based method, they do not provide fine control on the kind of responses that gets generated. And uh, there are uh, some one specific uh, method which is used very often now, I did not talk about uh, uh, today given the time prop, uh, limit of time. Uh, there are something called pre-trained networks and they are very heavily used now for building dialogue systems. But these pre-trained networks uh, suffer from what is known hallucination, which means that they are going to generate response back, which is not correct, which is factually incorrect. And uh, this is what is called the problem of hallucination of these models. So these deep learning based models, 
are very hard to interpret why they said what they said. They're hard to control and you can't trust them because uh, these models uh, hallucinate a lot of times and they generate things which are not factually correct. So that's the problem uh, with deep learning based Achim. models. Yeah. Sachin, uh, yeah? can I request you to um, end, uh, two to three minutes and then we can have a discussion after big uh, uh, talk also? So can you please conclude to three minutes, please? Okay, three minutes. Okay, I will do that. Yeah. So uh, basically <laughs> you need to, what you need to do here is to ground the response on something we trust, right? So that's what is, that's how, so the, the work here is how we make deep learning based models to ground their responses on something that we trust. And the industry dialogue framework, which has a lot of manual effort done there, we need to kind of bootstrap using deep learning models. We don't have to use deep learning models, but we could use deep learning models to build uh, uh, the framework based, uh, which are there provided by industry. And another thing that we could do is to use these deep learning based models in a controlled environment like human agents. So uh, rather than giving them for self assist use case, humans agents can use these deep learning based methods uh, and you know can verify that what they are saying is correct and then only kind of move on to self assist. So that's how these gaps are being bridged on both sides. Uh, on uh, on grounding the dialogue on uh, something that we trust. There is a lot of work that is happening where you are grounding the dialogues uh, responses on something that you trust like flowcharts or like documents. And here is an example where uh, uh, there is a data set that we have as well as there is a leaderboard that we have uh, where, we have, where we have released this data set where there are conversations which are grounded on flow charts and you, you so what you can basically use it uh, to create more trustworthy conversational system. Uh, similarly, there are other uh, data sets that have been released by uh, other folks as well as for uh, by us, where we have grounded the conversations on documents. So what you see here on the right hand side is a document and a conversation where the responses are coming from the document. So you trust those things. Uh, again, there is a, uh, 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 a URL where you can get this data set as well as there is a leaderboard here which is running. So there are these kind of things where we are grounding the response generation of dialogue systems on something that you trust. Uh, on the industrial side, you basically, what you do is that you take these uh, conversations that you have, and then from these conversations mine or extract uh, the kind of uh, intents that users are expressing. Uh, like, you know, my system keeps getting rebooted uh, because these are different conversations and you can mine what are the different intents people are talking about from past conversations and how they are being responded back in the actual conversation. So you can get system responses candidate from that. So this is what uh, we actually did with Watson Assistant where you can now actually uh, view intent recommendations based on a past set of conversations, human to human conversations that you can upload and it gives you back, you know, here are different kind of intents that are being expressed. So you can use that into, and this is how they are being expressed. And you can use these intent to build your bot. So that's how, uh, and then finally, uh, you could actually use these deep learning based things into agent assist platforms. So what you see here is a uh, live person uh, desktop, uh, which is used by human agents. And when they are conversing on the left-hand side, they are conversing with a end user. So agents, uh, human agents and uh, end users are talking on the left-hand side. And on the right hand side, you get recommendations on how you should respond back. And these, these recommendations are coming from deep learning models. So based on the way these things are used, you can now know exactly how much to trust these recommendations as well as adapt the model so that you can, uh, you can get them uh, you, you know, more trustworthy. So uh, at a high level <clears throat> to conclude, uh, deep learning based dialogue systems have made a lot of progress, but they're still far from being practically useful in enterprises. Uh, the way these responses are generated, they need to be approved. They need to be grounded on an approved content, on a content which is trustworthy. And there is a lot of uh, effort and work happening in this area, as well as there is also uh, other way uh, where deep learning based outputs are used in a controlled environment, like with human agents, so that you can tr put more trust into them and then use that to uh, bootstrap uh, models like uh, Microsoft Bot Framework and Watson Assistant. So that's where I will stop.